So welcome. Um, as I said before, uh, I'm a technical evangelist at Microsoft. Uh, I work for the developer experience team in Microsoft. Uh, as such, we always work with the latest technologies, uh, whereas the rest of the Microsoft team uh, is more uh, in marketing and sales, doing uh, established technologies. We do um, exciting, cool new stuff like uh, I IoT or Windows 10 or Azure or Office 365. Uh, our focus, of course, also changes with every year because every year something else uh, is new. Before I begin, uh, let me just ask a question. How many of you uh, are developers or have development coding experience? Oh, quite a lot. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> okay. So what I want to talk to you ab uh, about today is um, the uh, Windows 10 development plat platform and how you can leverage, this, uh, leverage it uh, to develop an app that works across different kinds of uh, device families with different kinds of form factors and how this would work. So these are some topics that I selected out of this. Uh, we call this adaptive apps. So an app can adapt to the different uh, kinds of devices where it runs on. Uh, from one side, uh, we are talking here about the UI experience. Um, and on the other hand, also on code level. Uh, and then we will just briefly uh, talk about different technologies, SDKs, framework uh, that allow you to use existing uh, development or existing uh, investments uh, that you have done for other platforms and how, uh, which possibilities you have to bring it over to Windows 10. So before I begin, uh, a little bit about Microsoft. Uh, we are not the same company we used to be 10 years ago. Uh, we have changed a lot, especially since Satya Nadella became CEO. Uh, we are uh, trying a new strategic um, orientation. We see this is a mobile first and cloud first world today. And this is where we want to position ourselves as a platform company, um, offering many kinds of um, possibilities that uh, developers can uh, use from the platform. So we have three strategic uh, points or three strategic directions that we focus on. And uh, one is, um, our, of course, our cloud business, our cloud platform. And we just don't just have a cloud platform, but it was important for us to build the cloud in a way uh, that enables all kinds of intelligent scenarios for today and for tomorrow. Uh, the other focus that we have is, of course, productivity. Uh, you know, um, uh, products like Office 365, um, uh, Skype, uh, SharePoint, OneDrive. And the last point is actually the point that we will be talking today. Uh, it's uh, creating a more personal experience uh, in computing. And here we will focus on Windows 10. So uh, over the last couple of uh, last uh, two, three years, we have also become very open, a very, very open company. And openness is defined in many different aspects. One aspect. Uh, is openness for developers. So our platform, uh, you don't have to be a Microsoft developer or a .NET developer using Microsoft technologies to benefit from the platform or to use services from the platform. We are open, our cloud is open to all kinds of um, operating systems, programming languages, tools, uh, development uh, processes that you use. So we have openness uh, as far as development uh, concerns. <clears throat> uh, another um, 
aspect of openness is openness as far as our own products are concerned. We offer now our own products on other platforms. Office is available also on uh, Android devices and also on iOS devices. In fact, it's one of the, in the top downloads. A couple of years ago, you could never imagine a Microsoft offering their own products and services for other platforms. But this is where we are opening up now. <clears throat> and the last part of openness is uh, related to consumers. So we are also opening up ourselves to consumers. Uh, maybe with Windows 8, you knew we received a lot of um, feedback on what users did not like with Windows 8, I mean, it was a radical change from Windows 7. So there was really a lot of feedback coming in. And for Windows 10, we already, before Windows 10 was released, already with a preview version, we started a program called Windows Insider. And in this program, people had, uh, normal consumers had the possibil possibility to test the preview version of Windows 10 but uh, not only test it, we have bought a feedback mechanism. So you, you, users could actually uh, say what they like, what they don't like, uh, where it doesn't work um, as good as they want. Uh, and uh, we have for every product um, a site called User's Voice. Uh, and you can just browse to, I don't know, for example, if you're uh, using Windows Phone, you could uh, use usersvoice.windowsphone.com. So we have for every product a user's voice site, and you can just um, you, you can just uh, tell your comments uh, or your feedback or your wishes, feature requests to that site. They get voted, and the product and engineering teams are really looking at those uh, at uh, at those requests. For example, for a Windows Phone, we have. Um, uh, realized 20 of the top most requested uh, requests, except for one, uh, which was uh, some feature should be available in Iran and it wasn't possible due to political uh, reasons. Uh, but anyway, this is, a, this is a way where consumers really have the possibility to define the next versions or the next features of our products. Yes. This is, this, this is really interesting. I think you're really reacting to local politics by stripping features of your devices, or, or how can I understand? Uh, this? Actually, I'm not really sure what kind of feature that was, so I cannot tell you what policy it was or what feature it was. But, but there are making special modifications for things distributed in special political environments. Uh, I mean, it's not common uh, so it's not you uh, shouldn't imagine like for every country we have a different set of features but it's just for a few markets that are uh, I guess China is restricted in some ways Iran is restricted so it could be that due to legal restrictions something may not be allowed in that country but I cannot give you more details on that because uh, I'm not aware what kind of feature that was now. <coughs> so um, we have already tried to bring uh, different operating systems um, where Windows runs uh, to one operating systems. And as you can see, we already started uh, with uh, Windows, uh, Windows 8.1 and Windows Phone 8.1. We already had qui uh, quite a story from developer point of view where you were able to uh, develop an app that uh, can run on Windows Phone and Windows 8.1 and you have one shared code base for both um, for the operating system of both devices but they were still um, two different binary packages uh, because uh, the it was still two different operating systems so the sharing was just on the code writing part, you still uh, packaged in two different um, fo packages and you still had to upload or submit it to two different phones, uh, to, sorry, two different stores, 
the Windows 8.1 and the Windows Phone 8.1 stores to distribute your app. And of course, you had to maintain both uh, packages. And with Windows 10, <coughs> we finally have one uh, platform that really enables you to have one app uh, that runs on different devices uh, everywhere where Windows 10 runs. So we have a couple of animations coming on. <laughs> And we call this platform the universal Windows platform, which really enables us from the developer point of view uh, to use different, really very diverse kinds of uh, devices. All of these devices which are, uh, which where Windows 10 is running. And as an app developer, I can just write my app once and it runs on all of these devices. Uh, if I want to distribute my app, uh, I have different possibilities. Of course, I have the Windows 10 store uh, with uh, different kinds of monetization uh, measurements, as you can see. Uh, it's like similar to other uh, app uh, stores that you know from Android and iOS. This is one way, but we also have a very good uh, way to distribute um, enterprise applications, enterprise apps because we have a Windows Store for business uh, with Windows 10. And uh, this enables enterprises to use, uh, for example, more flexible payment methods. In the Windows 10 Store, you need to log in with a Microsoft account. You need a credit card. This was very difficult for enterprises if they want to buy or purchase an app for all their employees. So the Windows Store for business allows you to use your uh, company credentials uh, if they're linked to Azure Active Directory, uh, they can use payment methods like purchase orders uh, and do volume licensing, purchase an app in bulk for all their employees, and they can also um, they can manage the licenses. So uh, the app belongs to the company, and if an employee leaves, they can just uh, as, uh, allocate the app to or allocate the license to another employee. As an app developer, you have the possibility to publish your apps in the public Windows, uh, Windows 10 store. You also have the possibility to publish in the Windows store for business, so uh, enterprises can acquire your app uh, in bulk for their company use. You can opt out. Uh, default is uh, that your app will appear in the Windows store for business. And there is also a possibility that an enterprise, uh, if they need your development services or they know you have a very good application and they want uh, you to directly develop for them, they can invite you uh, with your account uh, that you have for submitting apps to develop only for their store. So you can, uh, when you submit an app and you have been invited by a company to develop for their store, uh, you can select uh, the company and just publish your app to the store of that enterprise. So I mentioned before, uh, with um, Windows 10, you have the possibility to have one app and it runs on several different device families. And uh, when I said dif uh, several different device families, I specifically meant six device families as of today. Uh, and this is, uh, first of all, small devices like a Raspberry Pi, which I have one of here. And it's has a lot of cable, so I can't, uh, I can't hold it up higher. Uh, and it, it could also be other devices. It could be special phones or ruggedized uh, devices like tablets where Windows IoT uh, runs. So on this Raspberry Pi, I have a Windows IoT core running, but I have Windows IoT also for mobile uh, devices like special tablets or even desktop. Uh, then, of course, uh, my app runs on mobile devices uh, like phones, tablets, uh, and of course on desktops, all-in-ones, convertibles, 
everywhere where Windows 10 runs or on the phone Windows 10 mobile. And uh, <coughs> also on the Xbox, the support uh, is coming. Uh, we announced that Windows, uh, it will be possible to have Windows 10 applications running um, on the Xbox and then you can view it on your TV. Uh, this, maybe at this point I should mention Windows is changing to Windows as a service as opposed to the final Windows version that you knew from all those past years. This means that we don't have Windows 11 or Windows 12 uh, coming in the future, <coughs> but we have Windows 10 and all new features that we want to add will come through updates. This uh, is on the side of the consumer. On the side of the developer, it's the same. So uh, if there are new APIs coming out for Windows 10 uh, that developers can use in their apps, this will also uh, be uh, available through updates on Windows 10. And the latest uh, or our newest two device categories are Surface Hub and HoloLens. Surface Hub is a uh, <coughs> kind of uh, like a monitor, uh, a display that has all kinds of sensors built in uh, and all cutting edge sensors, special cameras and touch input and inking input. Uh, and it's specifically designed for collaboration. So you can uh, work on all your documents in video conferencing, write on it, draw on it, zoom, touch, uh, everything. So this is one of the new devices. And of course, HoloLens. Uh, HoloLens is a holographic computer, a complete holographic computer on its own, uh, where uh, you have in combination with augmented reality, you can see holograms on it. And all Windows 10 applications are by default um, holographic, so uh, every Windows 10 app you write uh, will work on HoloLens, but of course it will work as 2D, so you could basically display it on a wall. If you really want to um, leverage all the potential of HoloLens, uh, you would be doing 3D models, because then you can see the holograms really in the room. <coughs> So all of this is called the universal Windows platform. So when we talk about Windows 10 apps, we can also say UWP for universal Windows platform app. And uh, you as a developer have the opportunity to just develop once. Uh, it's one code base. And this one code base is also compiled into one package. And this one package will run everywhere where you have universal Windows platforms. So uh, on all these devices, um, support for Xbox is still coming with, uh, with uh, some of the next updates. It's not here today, but it, uh, it will also come. And uh, of course, this means I mean, you can see these devices are so different. I have a Raspberry Pi, I have a phone, I have a HoloLens. They're, they couldn't be more different from each other. So we do have um, different ways of how we interact with the devices. On a phone, I would use touch. Uh, and uh, on, on a HoloLens, uh, I will maybe look or use gestures same as the Xbox, maybe if I use it in combination with Kinect on a PC, I will work with keyboard and mouse. So we have uh, built in um, APIs and mechanism that you can use uh, the natural way how the user interacts with these devices. Of course, you only have one tooling. So you can use Visual Studio to develop it. You don't need a different tool for uh, the app on a different device and you manage also the package only once. Um, I said it will be compiled into one packages. Inside it's still three different binaries because you need different binaries for the different architecture x86 um, uh, and ARM or x64. Uh, but as a developer you just see one package so you don't have to worry about this. 
Yes, so in what way or what are the possibilities to develop for Windows 10? Uh, what you see here is the classical desktop world. So classical desktop applications still work. Windows 7 applications still work. You can still develop classical desktop application. And in some scenarios, uh, this might be the thing that you need. Uh, maybe if you really need uh, low level access to the operating system, or um, if you need, for example, to write into the registry, and things like that. But we're talking today about the universal Windows platform, uh, which is the layer that runs on all these uh, devices that we were, device families that we were talking about. And here you have different possibilities to develop in it. Of course, you can use .NET, uh, C Sharp, Visual Basic. You can develop in C++, use uh, XAML. Um, it's an XML syntax for the, for, uh, for the UI. Uh, or you can also natively develop in HTML and JavaScript. Uh, and we have a specific library, WinJS, that uh, exposes to you the different APIs that are available in the uh, universal Windows platform. So these are the ways to natively develop for the universal Windows platform. But we also have um, different uh, possibilities. Uh, we call it bridges or bridging technologies. Uh, it's basically just different kinds of frameworks or tools or SDK SDKs that you use for code that you have written for some other platform. And these technologies help you to bring your code over uh, in an easier way or with not as much um, effort to bring them to the universal Windows platform. Uh, which uh, means you don't have to like rewrite all your code to natively develop for the platform. And then uh, you have a package that will run on all these device families we mentioned before. Okay, so I've been talking several times about Universal Windows Platform. What is it? It's actually nothing but uh, a set of APIs that I use uh, in, my, uh, in my program, my code. And as long as I only use these APIs, it is guaranteed that I have uh, one package that runs on all the devices that have the universal Windows platform layer, all the devices that run on Windows 10. Uh, I mentioned before that we don't have final Windows versions anymore, but Windows as a service, which means we don't write apps for Windows 10, but we write apps for the universal Windows platform, and we write apps for the platform in a specific version. Because um, as we have new versions, we might have new APIs coming out that you might want to leverage in your code. And uh, you can just declare it in your manifest for which version your um, app uh, works. Yes, and basically you have this one package that you get, uh, which will run on all devices. So before I talk uh, about adaptive apps, I would like to show you just a, sam a sample demo app. And uh, this is just a demo, so don't expect the best graphical user interface. It might even crash. Um, it's an app. Uh, it's called Faceit. We are using some uh, APIs from Project Oxford. Does anyone know Project Oxford? So Project Oxford exposes some APIs to developers that makes use of Azure machine learning, uh, where you can do uh, easily built in intelligent features to your app. And the specific um, APIs that we are using are the face recognition APIs. So what those APIs do, uh, if you um, submit a photo, uh, it will uh, analyze whether you're male or female, and it will also analyze 
or tell you what it thinks how old you are. <laughs> it's actually funny. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, uh, if you want to try it, uh, it's called, uh, there is a demo site, I think, howold.net. You can share yeah. it in the newsletter after. Uh, yeah, we'll share it afterwards. <laughs> so this is just a demo app and you will not see the age. It will just uh, show you, we will make a picture from the camera. And uh, well, it's actually a kind of a store application. So based on the gender and on the age it recognizes it will give you three uh, product uh, not three it give you it will give you different product recommendations it could be one or it could be three um, based on your age and gender so a, a store could use this for example uh, at the front door whenever somebody comes in uh, to give personalized product recommendations and uh, we will run this now. Uh, let me just uh, show you this. Uh, this is uh, a JSON file where I configured what parameters uh, these Project Oxford APIs should use. So you can just say um, if somebody is single, male, and this age, then this page should be shown. So you could um, customize it with whatever you're using. And let's just run this for a moment. Uh, and this is now a UWP app that I'm running on the desktop. And the same app with the same code is something that I can also run on a phone or on any of the other device families. Okay, so uh, this is the app, which is using my webcam. And let me just take a picture. So now it should rec it recognize my face is here. Uh, it's in the color all orange, if it's visible to you. Uh, and um, if I were a male, or if it recognized me as a male, it would be blue. And now it recommends me three pages. So based on my gender and on my age, uh, it, uh, well, really based on my JSON file, it uh, recommends me to the Xbox. Uh, or the HoloLens, <laughs> which is cool, um, or a Windows phone. And uh, I have two of these uh, three devices. I guess you can guess which one I don't have. <laughs> so this was the app uh, running on my desktop. Now I would like to run the same app on a Raspberry Pi. And this is actually a use case which could really be used because uh, somebody, I mean, you know, the Raspberry Pi is a really small computer. You could just mount it near the door somewhere and have a s webcam. I have a webcam attached to it. And in the Raspberry Pi, on the Raspberry Pi, uh, I'm running Windows IoT, Windows 10 IoT Core, which is free. So if you have a Raspberry device, you can just download that operating system. And I will run the same device on the Raspberry Pi now. So what I will do is uh, I change here to ARM. Uh, and I have already set up remote machines. So this will be uh, deployed on my Raspberry Pi. But we will switch uh, to the other screen now. So I see what's actually on my Raspberry Pi device. Okay, so here you see Windows 10 IoT Core uh, on my Raspberry Pi. Uh, basically, um, you don't do much else here. You run applications on it, and uh, it can run one application at a time. Uh, you see some kind of configuration data. You can set the networking. And uh, I will just um, click on Compile and Deploy, and it should deploy on that device. And it actually takes a little bit of while. So while I'm doing that, I'm showing you the same, the same app with the same code deployed on my phone. I actually wanted to deploy it live, but uh, I, I misplaced my cable somewhere today. <laughs> so uh, I'll just show you here. Have the same app here, so you can't see it, but let me just take a picture of you. 
like this. So he should be recognized as a male. And in a bit, we should have some, well, we can already see that we have three results coming up. And I don't know if you can see it, but there is an Xbox also for him <laughs> as a recommendation. And this is now the screen that we're seeing on our Raspberry Pi. So I will take this camera here and take a picture of me. So it's a bit, OK. So it's not um, it's a little bit blurry. But we can see we have the different results. And uh, I mean, you can see this is running on a Raspberry Pi, but ideally I would um, optimize the performance a, a little bit on this device because it doesn't have the same specifications. So this is uh, just so you can see. Uh, let me just switch again to the other. So uh, by the way, we also have an app for our room, so we can uh, control all the technologies in the room by the, uh, with the app. Uh, and our technician is called Mike. So the app is called Mr. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have to switch again for the other beamer. Out for me. Okay, so what you saw right now is that we ran the same app with the same UI uh, on three different devices uh, with really different display sizes. But uh, in order to have a good user experience, it would be good to adapt the UI for the different kinds of devices that I'm using. And uh, we are actually s referring to um, adaptive apps in this context, which means that uh, we uh, adapt, first of all, our UI to the different kind of um, resolutions that we're working with. Uh, I mean, if we are displaying our app on a TV, it's uh, even, uh, you would have a lot of blank space and uh, you might just want to show instead of just blowing the U UI up, you might just want to show more information, for example, or hide some information on your phone or mobile screen. So we can do this with adaptive UI. Uh, and on the other hand, when we, do, when we are talking about adaptive apps, we might also want to use some special features that are only available on one device family. For example, on this phone, uh, on this phone, I have a special hardware button to take a picture, but I don't have this uh, camera button on my desktop. And I might want to specifically use that. Or if I'm using a Kinect, uh, I might want to use the Kinect, which I don't have on my phone. So here we are talking about adapting our code at runtime. So let's first talk about adaptive design. Uh, of course, you can, uh, uh, you can build in responsive design, which we all know from web development. Uh, what we have um, uh, uh, offered you uh, in terms of controls that you're building in, many of the Windows 10 controls already have responsiveness built in. But sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes you need to make more changes. And for this, we have visual states which help you to, um, to use a layout uh, that is triggered for a specific state. Uh, and you can just adapt your layout for phone, for example, and for desktop. And sometimes even this is not enough. And you just need a completely different UI for uh, a different device family. Uh, here we are talking about tailored designs. So you have all these options available to you when you're developing. 
Uh, this is an example of adaptive design. We see it's basically the same UI, but the buttons are arranged in a different ways. Uh, the picture is landscape here on the phone. It's portrait mode. This is an example of tailored design, which means this is not just rearranging this UI on the phone. It's really a completely different UI for the phone. And uh, in Windows 10, we also have a feature called Continuum, which requires specific hardware. This uh, 950 phone has this hardware, uh, which means if you connect this to a monitor uh, or to a keyboard and mouse, it basically becomes like a desktop. And you can use, for example, Office apps, or you can use your own developed app on the big screen. Uh, basically, Continuum, as a, from the developer point of view, uh, it means uh, nothing else uh, than that you have a, a UI that adapts to different screen sizes. Here we see how it would look like. So uh, you would just develop um, for two different screens. And I would like to show you this uh, in a demo now. So I have a sample. Uh, I have a simple uh, to-do application here. And I've actually opened it not in Visual Studio, but in Blend, which is uh, kind of like a sister product to Visual Studio. But it's specifically desi uh, designed for designers <laughs> to use. And if we just run this application, So it's taking some time. Yes, so here we have this applications. And you could imagine this is running on a desktop now. And now if we uh, decrease the screen size, uh, we have our to-do items here. We can add some more. Uh, and uh, we can take a picture, edit something. So we have our to-do items list here, and here we have a editor page uh, to edit the item. And uh, now I'm decreasing the window size. And this could be a tablet format uh, where I'm removing the editor page. So if now I click directly on an item, I see the editor page and co uh, can go back. And if I decrease it a little bit more to simulate the phone factor, uh, I'm even removing the pictures here and just uh, showing um, a normal list. And for this, we can use the visual states that I just mentioned. Uh, in Blend, you can actually do it um, with a UI. So if you, oh, uh, in Blend, you have this uh, tab called States, where you can manage different visual states. And a visual state is something where you can then, in the designer, you can drag and drop UI controls or change properties of UI controls. And everything you're doing while you're in a specific visual state is sort of recorded. And this will be done whenever the, device, whenever the uh, app is running in that visual state. And in order to a run or to change the visual state, you need a trigger. And Windows 10 has two built-in triggers, uh, which is window height and window width. So we have, in this case, we have two visual states. One, uh, let me just show you here. Um, so this is visual state 800. And I told you we have two built-in triggers, which are called adaptive triggers. So we have added an adaptive trigger here. Uh, and these two triggers are on window height and window width. So in this case, I said whenever the app is, um, the width of the app is 100, 800 pixel or more, you, uh, this visual state is triggered. And here we have a visual state 0, uh, which is basically the same thing. Uh, in order to work, you have to say window width one, not zero. But whenever the app is uh, from zero to eight uh, to seven ninety nine, uh, this visual state will be triggered. 
And uh, if I click on a specific visual state, you will notice here you have um, a red frame in the designer. So now, now I can go ahead. For example, let me just add a visual state here. Uh, and we will call it visual state 500. And put an adaptive trigger for 500. So then I can now just choose any control. For example, this background. And give it some color. And if I run the same uh, app now, So I have here, I'm now in visual state 800. I'm decreasing a little bit more. So now I came into the visual, the new visual state 500 and decreasing a little bit more. Uh, I'm uh, in my visual state zero. Of course, um, I would do a better job at creating a better UX than just changing the color here. But you see what is possible. Uh, what we saw here right now is um, the two system built-in triggers, uh, but you of course have the uh, opportunity to uh, build in any kind of custom triggers, for example, for network connectivity. Uh, if I'm online, offline, uh, you are in that visual state and uh, adapt your UI to all kinds of scenarios that you can think of. So uh, additionally, specifically for the continuum feature, you could also use user interaction, this API user uh, interaction mode, which tells you if you're on a touch device or on a mouse, keyboard mouse environment, uh, which means you have connected your phone to a keyboard mouse, and you could use this to change your UI. Yes, as I mentioned, sometimes you want to use uh, specific uh, features uh, for your devices that are only available on that device family. And you can also do that. For this, we have this uh, API. In the API information, you basically use is type present. You use feature detection. So uh, if I want to use the camera button, I first ask, is the camera button available? on the device where my app is running. And if yes, I can just use it. Um, as I said, you have different versions of Universal Windows Platform. Uh, and in the different versions, you have also APIs in different versions. You might want to use new features, uh, but also make the app run on, uh, make sure it's backward compatible and your users who are not on the new version still have a running or working app. Uh, so you can use the same uh, class, which has another API called a um, is API contract present, which is basically the same thing. Uh, it not only asks if a specific API is present, but also if it's present in a specific version. And if yes, you add the new code uh, for the new feature, and otherwise you still use your previous code. And of course, uh, your app can run on all device families, but you might not want uh, to have it run, or it might not make sense that your app runs on, <coughs> on an Xbox, for example. Uh, so you can uh, declare that in the manifest. Uh, in the middle example, for example, uh, I have an app that runs uh, on a lot of versions in every device family. But specifically for the desktop device family, it has a much or narrower set of supported versions. Yes, so how can I develop for Windows 10? Uh, I can use Visual Studio. Uh, we have different editions. The community edition is free for um, hobby developers, for open source developers. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can uh, check the exact license, licensing terms on the website. And you need a Windows 10 device. Uh, it does work on Windows 8.1. Uh, you might have um, 
difficulties using the emulator, uh, for example. If you want to learn more, we actually have something like an online academy. It's called Microsoft Virtual Academy. It has loads of um, online courses which are completely free and from experts on all kinds of development scenarios. So it's not, uh, of course, there is Windows 10 development, but there is cloud development, there is game development, uh, there is uh, mobile development, there is enterprise development, there is IT professional stuff. And it's not just Microsoft technologies, it's open source technologies. There are, there are no JS courses, there are all kinds of courses uh, that you can just um, check out over there. And uh, just um, for the last point, uh, I mentioned that we have different technologies to bring code from other platforms to the universal platform family. Uh, and here we see an overview of what possibilities we have here. So of course I can develop natively for the universal Windows platform. We will also have a bridge in future that enables kind of a porting for classical desktop applications. And then you can build into those uh, universal Windows platform features like integration with Cortana or notifications uh, and such. Uh, as far as web development goes, if you have, um, if your code lives on the web or is a web app, uh, we also have different possibilities. First of all, for Windows 10, we're using the Microsoft Edge. We have a new browser, Microsoft Edge, and we're using that rendering engine. Uh, you have, uh, of course, the possibility to use Cordova as a cross-platform uh, framework to develop in HTML, JavaScript for different platforms and also Windows 10. Um, and you can use hosted web apps. So if your web app is running on a server somewhere, uh, then you can uh, sort of package it into a universal Windows package and you can build in platform features like Cortana or like um, live tiles uh, or camera support or whatever. Uh, like yes? Wouldn't it be easier just to give us a tool where you can say, you have your W3C compatible code, which is good with every standard, and now you can convert it to Microsoft compatibility? Because that's um, basically what you need. Yeah, because you can yeah you, we do have a tool. Uh, I actually, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I had slides more in detail for that too. Uh, you can look at manifold.js. This tool will just, uh, you need Node for it. You can uh, install it via NPM. Uh, it will just look for your W3C manifest that you have. And it will automatically convert to a hosted web app, not just for, for Windows, but for iOS, Android, Chrome, Firefox, for all kinds of platforms. So you can, with this tool, you can automatically build hosted web apps for many platforms. Uh, take the clean code and then Microsoft yeah. Uh, but also for other platforms, yeah. not just Microsoft. <laughs> so yeah, you can have a look at that too. Uh, then we have uh, for mobile platforms, if you have um, uh, an app, an app in object written in Objective-C, we have a bridge which is in preview and open source on GitHub. Uh, so you can use that, import your Objective-C code with Visual Studio, add some platform specific APIs, which we have also exposed in Objective-C. Uh, and um, well, this is still work in progress. So there is a roadmap on the GitHub side, uh, which um, APIs are going to be developed next. So we don't have 100% um, Objective-C API coverage yet, but uh, the team is uh, happy to take your input if you're using it. Uh, and um, for example, saying I need this API, and they will see if there are a lot of requests coming in, they might change their prioritization. And then of course you have um, middleware pr platforms that are specifically designed for building apps cross-platform. In game development, we have Unity, where you can build your game for different platforms, also with Unity 5.2, also for Windows 10. And if you want to natively develop cross-platform, you can use Xamarin. A couple of days ago, we bought Xamarin. 
And uh, here you can develop in C Sharp and you get an iOS, Android, and Windows 10 application. Okay, so basically I sh told you about universal Windows apps and how it can run on all kinds of different devices. We saw a sample app running on a desktop, running on a phone, and running on a Raspberry uh, Pi device. And it was the same code without any modification. But I showed you also how it is possible to build in modification and still have the same app, but uh, with a more targeted experience for the device and for the way the user interacts with the device. Uh, and lastly, we saw different, uh, what kind of different technologies there are to bring code from other platforms to the universal Windows platform. I thank you for your attention, and if you have questions, I'm still here.